I said this at the first service. I, I, I truly think Barbie tried to bring her A game today. She sensed, she sensed the challenge last week. She took it up a notch. Don't worry. I'll be back. All right. You guys give me a microphone for 35 minutes every week. All right. That's plenty of songs I can sing. You want to do higher love? That's all right. You may get some glory at Stefan when you don't realize it. You never know. You never know. I promise you this, I won't sing today, but I also promise you this, you'll hear me sing again, all right? So just prepare your minds and your lives for that. <laughs> Welcome to the gathering. This is our Stuck Series. My name is Joel Reynolds. I'm the teaching pastor here, um, and I'm excited to be in our third week of this series. Um, and today we're going to tackle this idea of what it means and what it feels like and how can we get out of being stuck in our circumstances. And as I was preparing and kind of getting ready for today... Um, I started thinking about back to when I was in youth ministry. I, th that's my wheelhouse in, in ministry. It's kind of where I cut my teeth and in and, uh, and church work. And so I've always kind of been a youth pastor. And, um, and it, I think in a lot of ways it prepared me for this. Um, the challenging part is not teaching at a different level or having more time or less time or bigger crowds or whatever. The, the real challenge is with like my teenagers when I worked with them. You know, I could bribe them to listen to me by having really awesome some trips. Like, I don't have any trips for you guys, so you don't have to listen, you know. But with them, they knew if they, you know, Joel's going to talk for a little while, but then we're going to go to Six Flags. You know, we're going to go to the beach for camp. When I, when I first got my, my very first full-time job, I was down in Chattanooga, um, right out of seminary, and, and my mentor, guy's still the men, a mentor in my life, one of my best friends, I replaced him as a student pastor, so I kind of looked to what he had done the year before I got there and just really kind of carbon copied it. And one thing they had done was gone on whitewater rafting trips. That's something I'd never done before, and if you've ever been whitewater rafting, you know kind of the experience that it is. When you're in Chattanooga, you just go right up the highway to Ocoee. Okoe is a world-class whitewater rafting venue. That river is where, where if you want a whitewater raft or kayak or canoe, that's where you go. And in fact, the Olympics, the, 90, the 96 Olympics, the, the only part that was held outside of Georgia was in Okoe, Tennessee. And it was in the state of Tennessee where they had the Olympics as well. And in fact, all of us from Tennessee, we don't even believe the Olympics happened anywhere but Tennessee. <laughs> So when you go to the Okoe, you know, they, they, they sh you show up and we loaded our students up and got all of their waivers and everything like that and all their money and we drove up to Okoe and when you get there, you know, this, this place, this outfitter we worked with, you know, their, their bread and butter were youth groups and so they were ready for us and said, hey, you guys just wait here in just a little while, we'll take you over to the side here and kind of get you guys set up and, and ready to go kind of talk through the day. Kind of made it nice and sweet and easy. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be great. Never done it before. You know, never taken a group to do this before. I was like, oh, okay. And we get over there and everything changed. It wasn't like nice people anymore. It was this, this river guide like slash drill sergeant. And he was like yelling at us. And he's like, if you guys don't take this seriously, you're going to get hurt. And I'm like, hurt? What? And, like, and he's like, you got to listen up to what we're going to say. You got to do these things that may save your life. I was like, save my life? What? I got, I got 12 year olds on this trip. What are you talking about? And they start telling us like what we need to do. Like, now when you get in the boat, you have to sit like this. You put your feet here. This is going to help you to, to keep you in the raft instead of falling out. I'm like, we can fall out of these things? And they're like, and when, when you fall out, when, he emphasized that. I was like, when I fall out, I'm not I'm signed up for this. He's like, when you fall, you need to position yourself in the water because it's going to be rapids and white water and rocks. And I'm like, what? How, how did, why am I doing this? Like, you got to position yourself so you can go down the river and, and this will help you so your feet and your legs will take the brunt of hitting rocks. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, a, this is the worst idea ever. And then he's like, all right, so that's how you sit, and that's how you, that's how you do your whitewater float if you fall out of the raft. Now let's get our helmets. I was like, helmets? <laughs> what are we in, like a coliseum? Is this like gladiator fighting that we're going to do? I'm th and, and you know the, the wild thing about this? We pay them to do this. <laughs> they make their money off of our death. That's what they do. 
And then they take you, you got your helmet, <laughs> you know, you got your helmet, your battle axe, your shield, you know, bow and arrows, you're ready for the Hunger Games. And then they, they load you onto a bus with the boats on top, but you got to put the boats up there. Like, yeah, you got to lift these on top. I'm like, this is the worst run business ever. You guys are making a racket. And then you drive up to the top of the river, and then you got to get all the rafts off, and then you carry them down this like 200-foot ramp to the water. Oh, and it's 60 degrees. The water's 60 degrees. I'm like, this is the stupidest idea. And like, lemmings, we just do it. We got our helmet on, you know, we carry it down. This water's so cold, I feel terrible. Let's go. And then they push you off into white water where people can die and get hurt and get thrown out. In fact, they expect that to happen. They don't feel like you get a full trip without that. And I'm like, why am I, I'm just paddling. I'm like, this is so stupid. Oh, I guess we keep going. Because the only way to get off of that river is to go down that river through all the madness that they said is going to break and hurt us. Whoever thought that up is the smartest person after the person who thought up Chuck E. Cheese for kids. Both torturous, both money suckers. And I got thinking about when it comes to our circumstances, it can feel like that. Life is this river that is wild and untamed and there's waves and rocks and all these things that can hurt us and break us and tear us apart. And we're just kind of shoved out into it sometimes. Our circumstances are so overwhelming that they're, the waves are crashing over us. The river is dragging us down. It can suck us under at any moment. It can beat us and batter us. We're stuck in that. Many of us here today in this room are stuck in that type of life. So I want to introduce you to somebody because I think scripture speaks to whatever circumstance we're in, whatever circumstance you're in. I want to meet somebody today, take a little bit of time to look at somebody who was kind of on that river. He was being beaten and battered and broken. And that had been his cycle for a long time. It's in the book of John chapter five, John chapter five. We're going to meet this guy who's in a very similar predicament. So if you have your Bible or smartphone or tablet, uh, the, the, the scripture is also in the worship guide. And then because we love you, we're going to put it on the screen as well. But I want us to look at John chapter 5, starting in verse 2. John chapter 5, verse 2. Let me read it for us. It says this. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. Bethesda literally means house of mercy. So this pool is a house of mercy because John tells us it has these colonnades and a roof over it. It's this place where people come hoping for mercy, hoping for change, hoping for healing. It's this large pool that John tells us was by the sheep gate. And the sheep gate was exactly what it's named for, all right? This isn't a creative name. It's a practical name because every day this gate around the walls of Jerusalem would open up and the shepherds and the ranchers and the goat herders and the cattlemen, they would all bring these animals in through this gate to be used and sold in the marketplace for sacrifices or for food or for wool or whatever. So this is a place in the city where hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people every day travel through. They walk right by this pool every single day. Because this is where the, the, the merchants were working and the, the shepherds were working. And they come here and John says um, in verse 3... That in these lay a multitude of invalids. So around the spools, a multitude of invalids. And he says, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Each day, hundreds of blind and lame and, and paralyzed people come to sit by this pool. They may have been carried through the gates or they were able to, to, to move their way through that, that sheep gate to where this pool is. Hundreds of them every day. And they would come to sit under the shade that's offered by the roof. Many of them would come to rest. I would think most all of them were coming for mercy. But mercy not from what the waters could do. Mercy hopefully from people passing by. They were begging there. They had their signs. We'll work for food. Fallen on hard times. 
just stuck in my circumstances, holding them up, hoping that somebody will come by and show what the Jews called the giving of alms, which was giving money to the poor. They would come and be in such a state that hopefully somebody would give them some money so they can maybe make it through lunch or dinner or that day. Every day going by, resting, sitting, begging, and hopefully getting healed. That's why they came to the water, to this place, this place of mercy, this house of mercy, hoping somebody would help them or hoping that the water would heal them. I would think that all of them would rather be in a different place. I would venture to think that they'd all want to be doing something differently. They, they wanted to be about a different thing than sitting by this pool day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. But it shows us something about being stuck. It shows us that being stuck leaves us in some places that we did not plan. Just like these invalids by the pool, we're stuck in a place, and, and it's not a place we ever thought we would be. Maybe it's, it's stuck in a job that we just took because it was a good opportunity then, and here it is 10, 15, 20 years later, and we're still doing it. We still hate it. We hate our desk. We hate our view. We hate our boss. We hate everything about it. We're stuck there. Perhaps we're, we're stuck in a marriage that has, has long lost its love and intimacy it's a far cry from the vows that you took on your wedding day. Maybe we're, we're stuck daily going back, finding healing from a bottle, from a substance, trying to numb the pain that has come from our stuckness. Just like the fact that down by this pool came the blind and the lame and the paralyzed, we see that being stuck takes on many forms and many titles. And all of us here today, many of us here today, are stuck in different ways, in different circumstances. Often those circumstances are not our own choosing. This is not what we, we plan. It's just how life happened. I wish I had a better answer. I wish I had something great. I wish I had a, a potion I could pass to you before you leave today. Drink this and it's all going to be okay. It's not how life works sometimes. It's hard to be in our skin. It's hard to walk in our shoes. It's hard to be in the circumstances that we are. But it's how it is. Either way, either way, we are at places we did not plan, that we did not plan to be at. And just like these invalids around Bethesda, we're looking for mercy, just like they're looking for mercy. John tells us about one person at this pool in particular. In verse five, it says this. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years, 30 years. Eight years. Life expectancy for men in Jesus' time was between 35 and 40 years. So this man had been an invalid for as long as most men would live in that time. 38 years he had been stuck. 38 years he had been considered an invalid. It doesn't say specifically what it was, but we're guessing he couldn't walk because Jesus later will tell him to walk. He was stuck there 38 years by this pool, day after day, getting somebody to show him some mercy to carry him there, somebody to show him mercy by tossing him some scraps of food or some money. 38 years, this is what he did. This was life for him. This is all he knew. These were his circumstances. And it shows us another thing about being stuck. Being stuck leaves us some places longer than we planned. Not only does it take us to places we don't want to go or didn't plan to be, but it leaves us there longer than we thought. And we have all the good intentions. Tomorrow, start of the new work week, I'm going to change it. Or we wait every year for January 1st to roll around. This is going to be my year. We start another diet or we start another financial plan or we go back to the classified ads. We're like, we have all the good intentions to do this. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to break out of this cycle. 38 years I've been in it. It's no longer, no longer, no longer. We have to realize something that oftentimes the power of good intentions can only work by the power of God's intervention. The power of our good intentions Many times it can only work by the power of God's intervention. So it's a good thing that Jesus shows up in this story. It's a good thing that he comes to show how we can go from being stuck to having life. In verse 6, John tells us what Jesus did. It says, And Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew. 
It says he knew. Last week we saw Jesus meeting this woman at the well. And it said that he had to go through Samaria. When everyone else would go around rather than through, Jesus had to go through. And it was my thought and intention and interpretation, maybe yours as well, that Jesus had to go there to meet that woman in that circumstance, in that stuck place. In the same way we see Jesus today divinely knowing that this man had been stuck there for 38 years. This man had been stuck in these circumstances. And I've been thinking all week when I've been going through these verses and reading them and, and, and pondering them, why was Jesus drawn to this man? John tells us there were multitudes there, hundreds of people in similar situations we're, we're, we're stuck there as well. Why was Jesus drawn to them? My most philosophical, theological answer that I can come up with this morning is this. Jesus went to that man. He knew that man. He was drawn to that man because he was the most stuck. And many of you here today, you're the most stuck. So it's a good thing that Jesus knows you. He knows your situation. He knows your circumstances. Because Jesus is drawn to the messed up, to the jacked up, to the screwed up. He's drawn to the hopeless causes and cases. This is his specialty. Others may not know the circumstance that you're in. You've done a really good job masking it. Way to go. You've covered it. You've, you've, you've wiped away your tracks. Good job. You've done a good job, and we, we can't tell when we're out in the hall here, the people you work with. Maybe your spouse can't even tell. Your loved ones can't tell. I tell you this today, Jesus can tell. Jesus knows that you're falling apart on the inside. Jesus knows, and he's moving towards you. Which shows us another thing about being stuck. It's this. Being stuck in, the, in some places Jesus never plans to leave us. Being stuck is, is in some place that Jesus never plans to leave you. He is moving towards you just like he was moving towards this man. Let's pick up with the second part of verse six. It says, Jesus saw him lying there and he knew that he had already been there a long time. And he said to him, do you want to be healed? Remember our pattern of John. Jesus asks a question, the person responds, kind of misinterpreting the question. Jesus says something spiritual, they misunderstand. We see that same pattern here again. It's Jesus initiating, Jesus asking. And he says, do you want to be healed? The other thing I've been wondering about this week is, why would Jesus ask that? Jesus makes me scratch my head sometimes. I love him. I'm glad he's come into my life. But there's times where I'm like, seriously, Jesus? Do you not know which pool you're at? This isn't the pool of bathing. It's the pool of Bethesda. It's a pool of healing, a place of mercy. Did, did Jesus, did you not know why he was there? But he comes to him and he says, do you want to be healed? Could it be? This is where I've landed. Could it be that this man wasn't thinking about being healed that day? Could it be that he was showing up because that's just what he did? That was his circumstance. That's what he did. He was stuck. And he was just showing up again and again and again. Not thinking today. Not having the expectation that today he could be healed. Jesus is looking at me and saying, do you want to stand? Do you want to walk? Do you want to move? Do you want to live? Jesus was seeing how serious this invalid man was. How deep, how desperate his will was. Because when we're stuck, we learn some things about our circumstances. One of the things we learn about our circumstances is that being stuck, it it's a condition that takes away our will. It takes away all of our will. We've been hoping and praying at first. These things have happened and we're like, oh man, this is bad stuff. I can't wait for a change. I can't wait for healing. I can't wait to be fixed. I can't wait to be changed. But then over time... It starts to wear us down, grind us down, chew us up, spit us out. And we just accept it as our lot in life. Our will dries up and it just blows away. When Jesus goes to this man, I think perhaps he's seen how deep the well of this man's will was. When our circumstances are rough and they've been a part of our life and our story for so long, we just simply accept it. It becomes part of who we are. 
which shows us something about circumstances. Our circumstances, they become our definition sometimes. They become, it defines who we are. This man's identity was as an invalid. John doesn't even give us his name. He says there was one invalid, one guy. It doesn't even tell us what he specifically had wrong. He was just an invalid because that was his definition. That's how you defined him. That's how he defined himself. This was all he knew. This is all his life had ever been. And for many of you here today, it's the same way. For many of you here this morning, your definition is what you've been stuck in, the circumstances that have broken you and beaten you up. You'll always just be this. I'll always just be, go ahead, fill in the blank in your mind and your heart. I'll always just be this. I'll always be addicted to this. I'll never be able to pay my bills because of this. These circumstances have been in your life for so long and you've been wanting and waiting and wishing and hoping that the luck would go your way and you're kind of gambling on different things that maybe this will change some things. And all of a sudden, before we know it, our circumstances become all circumferencing. It's all we know. So when Jesus looks at him and he looks at you and he says, do you want to be healed? He's not being flip. He's not being rude. He's not being holier than thou. I think Jesus is being realistic. How seriously do you want to be healed? How seriously do you want to be unstuck? Because when Jesus shows up, it doesn't have to be that way. Look at what the man says. Remember, when these people get asked a question by Jesus and John, often they miss the whole question. And in verse 7 it says, the sick man, now he's called a sick man. He's not just an invalid, he's a sick man. The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going in, another steps in before me. What does this even mean? Like, why would he answer that? Well, the answer for us comes in verse 4. So look over in your Bible to verse 4. Wait, hold on. My Bible goes from verse 3 to verse 5. What happened to verse 4? I got to get, Paula, I need a fixed Bible, all right? This one's broken. Somebody's messed with it. In fact, when Dave, who, who does all of our media stuff, he came in this morning, he goes, hey, I was loading the verses up, and verse four's not in there. That's right. It's not. Because when they numbered the verses, this didn't happen when John wrote it. He wasn't writing a little tiny one and a little tiny two as he wrote the Gospel of John out. And in fact, if we can do a little seminary here right now, Bible interpretation, the, the goal when it comes to the New Testament of interpreting it and understanding it, our goal is to get to the source documents, the original documents that are as close to Jesus as possible. That's the goal in all this. Because when John wrote the gospel of John, it was well after Jesus came and lived and died. These were his reflections after Jesus had died after Jesus had been resurrected. Not just a few days or weeks or months afterwards, years and years after Jesus had come and done his ministry, John sat down and reflected upon it because people needed to know this story. With the church at this time, it was different. The Old Testament was well preserved and protected because that was a big part of their religion. You had to keep the scrolls so they were kept in, in, in good places and secured and the priests were always around it. Well, the New Testament, the church was scattered. They were being persecuted. They were being hunted down and killed. They were meeting in secret in some places. And so as the, 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 the New Testament writers sat down to write out what was going on, they were sending them around to people all over the known world in different cities and countries and territories. Many of them were, were meeting in one place the week before. And before the letter got there, they were in a whole different place because they were being hunted down. And so these, these letters were going out all over. And along the way, some of them were getting lost or they were getting, they were getting torn or ripped or they would land in one church and they would say, quickly, let's get somebody to write all of this down. We've got to have a copy for ourselves because it had to be sent on to someone else. And so the New Testament, the, the original documents that we have are fragments. Some of them no longer than, than a few lines or pages. But the goal when we find them is to date them and to understand where they were written in time. And the goal is always to get closer and closer to Jesus. So if you find a, a parchment from 70 AD, that's pretty good. Because that's only about 40 years after Jesus lived and died. It's only about 40 years after the resurrection. If it's from 200 AD, that's a little bit further out. And over time, things can happen to that. Or the, the, the person who was copying it has fallen asleep and they, they wrote the wrong thing. 
Somewhere along the line, the gospel of John was going out to these churches, to these people, and they were, they were reading it, and they were like, you know, the, the pool of Bethesda is a pretty neat place. The story is an angel will come down and touch the water, and will stir the water, and people will be healed. And they thought it was helpful for people to understand the whole context. So in verse 4, they wrote, an angel would come down and touch and stir the water, and the first one in would be healed. But that was written long after John had written it, and it was probably not even written by John. So this person wasn't being malicious or sinful or mean or rude or anything like that. He wasn't being disrespectful to God's word. He wasn't being disrespectful to what John wrote. He just simply thought it would be helpful to understand this. But the earlier manuscripts, the ones that were closer to Jesus, don't include verse 4. So that's why verse 4 isn't there, but it helps us understand the story. That's why this man says, when the water is stirred, when the angel touches it, I can't get in. I have no one to help me in. And if I do try to get in, somebody bumps in front of me in line. We don't know if an angel actually touched it. It may have been an underwater spring where bubbles came up. There may have been that one guy who always seemed to have bubbles following him when he got into the pool. We don't know. (laughs) But the tradition was, the details were, when the water stirred, if you get in, you're going to get healed. And this man was sitting and waiting in his circumstances. And it shows us another thing about circumstances. Circumstances will bury us in the details. He was giving Jesus details. In fact, the details had become larger than what his issue was. Jesus says, do you want to be healed? And his answer is, well, when the water stirred, I can't get in or nobody can lift me or people cut me off. That's not what Jesus asked, was it? Do you want to be healed? His answer was the details. We do that ourselves when we're stuck. Do you want change to come into your life? Do you want hope that doesn't seem to be there? Well, I got to get this worked out or that worked out. Or if my job would change or if I could get a promotion. The question wasn't, do you want a promotion? The question was, do you want to be healed? He gives Jesus the details because when we're stuck and our circumstances are burying us, we are buried in those details. We lose sight of what is really possible because all we know are these details that every single day we tend to tie on to the whip of our life and we beat ourselves with them. If only this, if only that, if only this, if only that. And we're sitting and waiting for an angel's touch to come and stir the water so we remain stuck in our circumstances. It's a very good thing. It's a wonderful thing. It is a freeing thing that Jesus doesn't work in the same details that you and I do. He doesn't deal in the details. Because look how he responds. In verse 8, Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed, and walk. It's one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. One, because it's really short. Two, because it's way awesome. Get up, take your bed, walk. He's calling him out of a circumstance. He's calling him out of stuckness. And we see here that the word of Jesus does more to solve circumstances than waiting and hoping and wishing and gambling and betting on something. Notice the difference between this and the last two weeks. The last two weeks there was this give and take, wasn't there? Nicodemus says this, Jesus says that. The woman at the well says this, Jesus responds with that. She responds with this, Nicodemus responds with that. There's no discussion here. There's no discovery here. Jesus says, be unstuck. We've had two weeks to kind of talk about discovering, understanding where we are and how we're stuck. The word of Jesus to you and I today is this. Don't be stuck anymore. 38 years is enough. 38 years is enough. And we see another thing about circumstances. Not only do they bury us in the details, but circumstances rule our days. This whole man's life had been ruled by his circumstance, had been ruled by his stuckness. But Jesus works by a different calendar. His planner is not temporal, it's eternal. You're stuck. It has defined you. It has buried you. It has ruled you. And Jesus shows up and says, I want to define you by holiness. I want to bury you in mercy. I want to rule you in grace. And look what happens in verse 9 when this man sees and senses this. It says, at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and he walked. 
It doesn't say that at once he sorted out some sticking points. He met with his financial counselor. He scheduled a time to get with his life coach. He didn't look over his planner and calendar. He didn't journal some things. At once, at once, Jesus speaks, healing comes. Which reminds us that healing comes in an instant. It can come in an instant. At once, his circumstances change, and so can yours. This is no Joel Osteen, pie in the sky here. This is no magic words. This is the marvelous words of Jesus. And when Jesus speaks, his words can trigger the faith in us to get up, to take our bed, and to walk. Faith enters, and we say, I'm not going to be stuck anymore. It doesn't say, you're going to figure it all out. The whole plan is going to be revealed for you. We simply have the opportunity now to respond to what Jesus is saying, what he is doing, what he wants for your life. He says, let's start here and we'll sort everything else out as we go. But we are so stuck in the details. We are so stuck in the days. Faith is enacted by the word of Jesus, from the mouth of Jesus. It's never the other way around. Jesus doesn't speak when we've shown ourselves ready for what he's going to offer. We are saved by grace through faith. Grace comes and then faith ignites. And it shows us that, that not only can healing come in an instant, but healing follows faith. Up until this point, this man, he showed no extraordinary faith. And that's because the stuck rarely do. Jesus doesn't look at him and go, get up because you're good looking. Get up because you're well dressed. Get up because you have your affairs in order. Get up because you've gone to church for 38 years. Jesus says, get up now. Show me that faith. And the man did. He showed his faith. Are we willing to do the same? Are we wanting to do the same? Because Jesus is at a pool of faith right now. He is at the pool of faith, the pool of mercy. And he's standing at the edge and he's wanting you to be stuck no longer. He's wanting me to be stuck no longer. And it's frightening for us. I get that. It's frightening because all we've ever known is being on the side of the pool. That's all we've ever known. This has been the whole journey of our life. We've been stuck there forever. But we see today that he's at the side of the pool and he's calling us, come and find healing. Come and be unstuck. Come and break free out of these circumstances. Let me do that in you. Come to the pool. Come to the pool. And he's waiting for us. And we see that he's not alone. Jesus isn't alone. Because we go back two weeks ago to John 3, where Jesus was working with Nicodemus, who was stuck in his religion. And Jesus said to him, unless one is born of water, they'll never see the kingdom of God. We go to last week when Jesus was meeting with this woman at the well who was stuck in relationships. And Jesus says, do you understand that I will give you water that will flow out of you? It's living waters. So Jesus is joined at the side of the pool with Nicodemus and the woman from the well. And they're saying to you, they're saying to you, man, trust this guy. He's different. But they're not the only ones there. See, the Holy Spirit is there with them. And the Holy Spirit is saying, this guy, Jesus, he knows his stuff. I saw him create the world. He was there with, with God, his father, and with me. And I saw what Jesus did. He filled the oceans. He filled the rivers. He filled the lakes. Listen to him. Come to this water that he's inviting you to. Noah is there. Noah's going, seriously, this guy knows water. I have a movie. This guy knows water. Moses is there. Moses is standing there at the side of this pool and he's saying to you, yeah, seriously, one time there was a whole sea in front of us and through the power, Jesus separated the, the, the waters, a whole sea, an ocean, and you know, we walked right through it. And Joshua was there. Joshua goes, oh yeah, yeah, one time I was on one side of the Jordan River and, and he separated the Jordan River and we walked through too. And then Moses goes, yeah, that's not as cool as an ocean. And, Mo and Joshua goes, well, I didn't say it was as cool. He's like, yeah, but you had to totally get in all my stuff. You know, why? You jonesing in on this. And Joshua like, seriously, it just, I'm just trying to, you know, get along with you here. And they're like, yeah, no matter what, even though Moses goes, mine was cooler. He knows water. He knows this. 
The disciples were there and they're saying, yes, listen to this guy. One time we were on a boat on an ocean and a storm came in and we were getting thrown about. We thought we were going to die. Jesus went to the edge of the boat and he said to the water, stop, be still. And it did. And Moses and Peter's there. And Peter goes, oh yeah, by the way, he, this guy walks on water. And one time he called me to walk on water too. And I did. They're all there. They're all there saying, listen to this guy, Jesus. He's standing by the pool saying to you, let the water heal you. Let the water heal you. Let your circumstances change. The, 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 they may seem powerful. These waters sweeping over us. They, they, they may be crashing down on us, sweeping us away. The waves beating us up. But we see today that Jesus is greater than the water. He's greater than the water because he didn't even touch the pool, did he? He said, do you want to be healed? be healed. He didn't even touch the water. That's how great he is. That's the water within him, the water of life, the water of change. Jesus rules the waters. He commands the waters. And he says, come to the water and be healed. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for Jesus. Oh, how overwhelming he is. We don't always get him. We don't always understand what he's up to. But we're sure glad he is where he is and he's doing what he does. We thank you that he's in our midst today. And I pray especially, Jesus, I pray especially that you'll break the hearts of those here today who are having their hearts broken again and again and again by the cycle of circumstance. Show them that there is another way, a way of healing. They won't get all the answers right now, but they'll get the answer they need most. That mercy is available for them. That water is there to quench their thirst, to quench their souls, to heal them. May they in faith reach out to you as you reach out to them and take your hand and go into the waters of faith and let that be what sweeps them away. Let that be what pours over them. Let that be what changes who they are. God, I don't want to be stuck anymore. I don't want these circumstances to rule my days. To help me lose sight of what my life can truly be. Honoring your son, Jesus. Telling the world about him. Inviting others to know. So heal me from my stuckness. Heal me from my circumstances. And give me life that truly is life. May that be the prayer for so many in this room today as they find the great mercy and the life-changing grace of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that I pray, amen and amen. I'm so glad you guys were here this morning. I wanna invite you back next week, all right? We're gonna keep going through this, this stuck series. I'm so excited for what we're gonna talk about next week. Next week, we're gonna be talking about being stuck in stuff being stuck in our stuff. And we're going to go to, surprise, surprise, the book of John, chapter 6. And so we're going to be in John chapter 6 talking about what stuff can do to us, how it can make us stuck, and how Jesus provides an answer that can change our lives. So your homework is this. Read John chapter 6 this week, all right? Go through it a time or two. If you're doing your homework this week, you already knew there was no verse 4 in chapter 5, didn't you? So you did your work. So let's do that this week. And I want you to do this. When you're reading John chapter 6, I want you to go and, and, and ask, who's Jesus talking to here? Because there's thousands of people. He could be talking to anybody in this story. But who is he specifically talking to? Maybe it's you. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's the people there. But I want you to read that and ask yourself that question and come back next week ready to continue to be unstuck from our stuff. With that, I'm going to dismiss you guys. Have a great week. We love you all. We're praying for you. Bye-bye.